So welcome everyone. Um, so as you see from the, the first slide, well, this is an old talk. Um, it was prepared for a workshop held up in Edinburgh, looking at code generation in a number of applications. And you know, followed about so five years of work that I've been doing with, with others on techniques that involved uh, code generation for uh, high performance computing applications. So in, in, in particular, Gihan and Ishvan were two postdocs who worked with me on this. G Gihan is now an associate professor in uh, Warwick in computer science, and Ishvan's uh, an associate pro professor back at home in, in Hungary. And so the two of them are continuing work in this area. Uh, and, uh, I, myself haven't really worked in this area probably since about 2017. Um, okay so please you know do put your know, questions in into the chat or speak up if, if, if you wish to I'm very happy to have questions as, as we go along. Uh, so uh, yeah this is the, the overview that I'll, I'll talk about so motivation and so my view on different approaches to the kinds of problems that I'm concerned with, uh, and then talk a little bit about you know, five different projects. And in fact, I've, I've written some notes here beside me about some other things that have gone on uh, since that I'm aware of. Um, if you go to my homepage, you, know, you can find my, my publications. I've also got a web page with lots of other past talks. Um, so there's lots of in information online. Okay. So let me first of all explain sort of where I'm coming from in, in this. So my, my background is that my undergraduate degree is in mathematics. Um, I then went to MIT and my master's and PhD are in aeronautical engineering. You know, for many years, I worked on computational fluid dynamics and it was a need to perform large calculations, which then sort of in, involved me in doing some research in high performance. So over my career, in a sense, I've, I guess, been at the intersection between applied maths, engineering, and then crossing over into computing at times as well. So as it says on this slide, I do come very much from the pursuit of a user. Um, so I'm trying to make things easy for people who would describe themselves as computational scientists or computational engineers rather than computer scientists. And I'm interested in helping them to develop high performance applications for the computational simulations of interest to them. And so going back sort of 10 years, um, you know, there was a lot of concern at that time about future proofing. Um, I'm not sure how, how much that's still a buzzword these days, but you know, there was this concern that um, there were a lot of new hardware initiatives. And that, at, at the time, GPUs were still relatively new. And people were concerned about how to develop applications which could run at high performance on a wide variety of different hardware platforms. Um, and you know, particularly in the area that I was in, uh, you know, collaborating with, with Rolls-Royce on you know, the simulation of gas turbine engines, um, you know, codes there have a long lifetime. Um, so 
you know, the code that I was responsible for, you know, the initial development of a code called, called Hydra, that has now been the main Rolls-Royce corporate CFD code for the last 10 years, I think at this point. Um, we probably developed it for five years before that. My guess is it's probably got another 10 year lifetime before it gets replaced by the next corporate code. You know, so you know, you're, you're in a situation where you're developing large application codes, which will be around for a couple of decades. And in that time, there's just enormous change in the computational hardware that it's going to be running on. So, so we want that future proofing, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of concern about the amount of effort it takes to develop software. And at, at that time, DARPA in, in the US had this initiative on HPC squared, where they were focused on you know, the productivity of you know, writing fresh software applications, as well as trying to simultaneously achieve high performance. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, this kind of goes without saying, although this, this bit about performance continuing to double every 18 months or so, that's increasingly sort of hitting a bit of a wall now. Um, but, you know, I guess, yeah, in increasing parallelism is, is still, uh, you know, taking us forward. Um, but as I said, you know, the challenge was how to, continue to get a decent fraction of peak performance, given that all of that performance was coming through massive parallelism. And so you know, that, that was the challenge, particularly moving to platforms like, like GPUs. Um, and so it, it's interesting looking at this list from eight years ago. Um, I'm not sure if, if people still work with TBB, thread building blocks, and Silk Plus, and OpenCL. Um, CUDA's definitely stood the test of time. Um, OpenACC, I'm not sure whether that's still going strong or whether that's been replaced by, I think it's OpenMP 5.0 that's maybe embraced some of those bits. Um, but yes, you know, the challenge was trying to write an application which could then use different backends on different hardware. You know, and clearly the key idea has to be some element of abstraction, separating out what the engineering um, so code developer is concerned with in terms of the, you know, what you want to be computed and separating that out from the how it's computed where you get into the details of the backend implementation. So approaching this, you know, very much as sort of engineering developers, if you like, you know, the way we approached this was first to work out what tricks you had to use on each new hardware platform in order to get really good performance. And so this is where you're really doing manual coding to get an understanding of what has to be done to, to achieve good performance. And, you know, data placement movement, you know, we're often the critical issues in this because so often, you know, code performance depends on on data movement and the cost of data movement, rather than the number of floating point operations uh, in the involved. Uh, I see Jim Jim Demmel's on the on, on the uh, you know it, it, it attending today, and so you know this is this is something where you know he's really you know led things in terms of you know the importance of of being aware of data costs and designing algorithms and, and implementations to, to address this. Okay. And then having done that sort of hand coding to get a good understanding, 
Then the question is, okay, now we want to do a big applications or we want to support people in a whole application class. What can we do to sort of encapsulate the understanding that we've, we've you know, generated and make it easy for them to get the benefits without them having to go through that same exercise? Okay. So clearly, you know, numerical libraries are very important that, um, you know, it often you can look at numerical algorithms and look at what the key parts are and identify key so library requirements. Um, and so in terms of GPUs, for example, this is something that we worked on and you know, contributed software that ended up going into NVIDIA's libraries. In, in, in NVIDIA, back in the days when it was a relatively small company, um, really worked very well with, with academic developers who would uh, develop software that NVIDIA then would take in-house and, and you know, maintain for the future. And so we, we, we did some work with them in the early days. Um, but for larger sort of problems or, you know, various classes of applications, it, it's not so clear that, that, that libraries um, are, are the solution to everything. Um, and particularly, I guess, for distributed memory computing, coming up with libraries that, you know, sort of capture enough of the need as to what needs to be done in, in, in a particular application. Um, you know, I think you have to sort of go, go beyond that in a number of, of applications and certainly for the things that, that we were looking at. Um, and yeah, so, so other comments here about ways in which your know, performance could potentially suffer with, with conditional branch dynamic memory allocation and things. So for what we were interested in, libraries didn't seem to provide you know, the solution. Now in, in the US, the, the, the DOE labs, the Department of Energy labs, my understanding at that time, and I, I think it's probably still the case, but maybe there are others uh, you know, here who can correct me on this, you know, are, are using C++ metaprogramming very extensively. Um, so that is not something that I know anything about. You know, my impression as, as a complete outsider is that it is a very powerful approach. And obviously, you know, the DOE labs are very happy with that approach and with the performance that, that they uh, are able to achieve using that. Um, I, I had heard that it was, it's incredibly tough debugging metaprogramming, that uh, the error messages you get are incredibly cryptic. So my impression, but again, I, I, I stand to be corrected, is that it really needs expert C++ developers to develop and maintain and use that, that kind of meta programming approach. Um, and certainly I am, I am not such a C++ developer. So that, that wasn't the direction that, that we pursued. Um, and so our, our approach was much more along the lines of automated code generation, targeting multiple backends. Um, so, you know, there are a number of sort of variations within that theme. Um, so the main specific languages, you know, actually constructing, you know, you know, defining new languages for a particular class of applications. I've, I've got a comment here that it's usually built on an open source compiler system or using some other special purpose language. That, I think I would now maybe back off of that statement that, you know, 
I think, um, you know, for example, you know, the work that David Hamm's done with, with Firedrake, where you sort of define the language you know, within, within Python and add, add you know, so construct the ability to define what you want you know, within, within Python and then have backend generation, code generation from that, um, you know, I think makes a lot of sense. So, I, so at the time I wrote these slides, I, I viewed this the DSL approach as something that probably wasn't, wasn't suitable for people like me, um, that it really needed computer scientists with, with the compiler expertise. I think now I would probably change this slide to um, you know, incorporate ideas like, like Firedrake. Uh, and, and what it's done with, you know, using Python. There was also um, some work done at University of Southampton on something called Open SBLI, uh, which again worked within Python. Okay. So what what we did so sort of fitted into this sort of category of domain specific abstraction using an embedded DSL. Um, so this was sort of working within either Fortran or C, C++, um, but within that, adding extra capabilities. Um, so as it says, either as an API or, or as pragmas and directives, um, such that you don't have to parse the entire user code. Um, that, that's kind of the key thing. But then, you know, using code generation at the back end, for example, to move things onto GPUs. Um, and then there's this dynamically generated libraries. Um, well, I guess, again, it's this idea that, you know, the user, you know, there's a specification of what is needed, but then there's code being generated um, potentially on, on the fly with just-in-time compilation to, to, to you know, perform some particular task. Okay, so, so what we would do is we'd start from a particular motivating application and I'll talk, talk about the applications of interest in, in a moment. Um, think about which apps wanted to work on. So generally we were looking at um, distributed memory systems uh, with multiple nodes, each node either having GPUs for doing the main number crunching or, you know, multi or trending. So that, that's the sort of thing we were looking at. Um, then we'd do experiments to figure out how to get good performance. So that, that, that would be hand coding. And then we'd look at the, the, the generalization of that. Um, we, we never did get to doing runtime uh, compilation, um, but I think in some cases that, that, that would have been a good idea and would have added extra performance. Okay, so the first project was, was OP2. Um, and David Ham um, talked about Firedrake earlier in the seminar series. I see that somebody called David uh, attending today. I don't know if that's this, this David. Um, so anyway, this, this project was with David Ham and Paul, Paul Kelly, who's Oh, like a computer scientist at Imperial College. So this was a joint project funded by, by EPSERC, you know, the UK uh, funding agency. Um, and so on OP2, I guess, was uh, so more the Oxford part of, of the project. Um, and for me, it was very much 
driven by the needs of Rolls Royce and this this Hydra CFD code uh, that that I mentioned before. So this was a CFD code that already had this sort of abstraction approach built into it from it, its earliest days, separating out you know the CFD algorithm definition, um, but then layering it on top of a parallel implementation framework. But the original framework, something called O+, um, was developed back in the days of single core processors. You know, so it, it was clearly in need of a major update. Um, and particularly at, at that time, we were concerned about GPUs. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm smiling at it saying, and maybe Xeon Phi here. We, we never did, did end up doing anything with, with the Xeon Phi. It became clear that that really wasn't going anywhere. Um, so you know, we were working on this to really provide the basis for Hydra going, going forward for the next decade. Um, but doing that required code generation. You know, because I mean, the existing code in Fortran you know, just, just wouldn't run on the GPUs. Um, um, but we did also add support for Fortran 90 and C++ in doing this as well. The, the original code was basically Fortran 77. I mean, it was really old Fortran. The, the abstraction in, in this case is we're looking at finite volume where we have um, a computational grid defined by grid nodes connected by edges, you know, with, with faces through which the flow is, is flowing. Um, and so we have these sets of objects, nodes, edges, faces. We have data sets associated with those. So for example, flow variables at, you know, defined at each of the nodes. We've got connectivity tables, mappings from edges to the nodes at either end. And then our algorithm is defined as a collection of parallel loops. And so each parallel loop will operate over all of the members of one of these sets, you know, for example, edges. Um, and in operating over all of the edges, for each edge, it would be working with data defined on the edge and also data defined with one level of indirection. So if the edge has a mapping to the nodes at either end, then the data could be associated with those nodes. And in defining parallel loops, the user had to specify how the data was being accessed. Now, I know that in principle, you could use a compiler to, to analyze the code to determine that. But the whole point was that we wanted to avoid getting into compiler technology. And therefore, we asked the user to uh, effectively annotate the code to provide that information. And so, you know, whether it was read-only access or write-only access, or whether it was doing an incrementing process. The key mathematical restriction in, in our work was that the set elements could be processed in, or, in any order or in principle simultaneously um, without affecting the, the, the result to beyond uh, machine precision. Certain numerical algorithms were ruled out by this you know, assumption or restriction. Um, but the ones that we cared about were, were fine. Also, this uh, assumed that the grid structure was static. So there wasn't any support for dynamic grid adaptation where you add in extra grid points and extra edges partway through the process in order to achieve better resolution of some flow feature. You know, the only support we had was you could move the grid points, but keep the connectivity fixed. 
th this gives you a sense of what the API looked like, you know, that there were initializations, declarations of the sets, declarations of the mappings between the sets, uh, declarations of the data associated with a set, um, some declaration of constants. Um, and then this is the key thing in terms of the parallel loop syntax, um, where we have um, here a parallel loop um, operating over the edges, um, calling a routine res. So that's the sort of elemental function being applied to each edge. That's just a label there. And then these data statements within the par loop declaration, this is declaring which data is being worked on in, in this loop. So here we have an array A, uh, array U, array DU. And what this is saying is that we're reading arrays A and U, and we're incrementing the array DU. Um, and here, this OPID, this is the identity mapping. So that says that the array A is a data set associated with edges. And so there's no indirection involved. Whereas here, U and DU are associated with nodes and call and row are two mapping tables, mapping from edges to nodes. And so that's, that's equivalent to this sparse matrix multiply. You know, so this, this is the equivalent C code uh, for this. Okay. And so, so in, in terms of the abstraction, you know, the parallelism is inherent in, in this concept, in this specification of the parallel loops, the, the data handles are completely opaque to the user. So once the user has originally declared the data sets, the user hands them over to the system. And at that point, the system can do with it you know, what it needs to in order to facilitate the computation. So in particular, in the distributed memory setting, the system, our, our OP2 system, would take responsibility for doing the domain decomposition and putting different parts of the grid on different nodes within the cluster. And also changing how it's stored, whether it's a structure of arrays or array of structures. You know, that depends on which platform you're running on as to which of those is, is best. And OP2 would then do data transformations, do all the exchange in the distributed. Um, some piece of the user code, which I described here as mean command and control. It's basically saying, you know, these are the parallel loops that we want to execute. And then you end up with the, with generation code that then does actually the execution of the parallel loops. Um, it, it mentions here there's lots of flexibility which we're not yet exploiting. We did subsequently exploit all of this. So once you've got this knowledge of what data is being worked on, you can do automatic checkpointing where you store the state of, of the calculation such that if the calculation dies because you're running on a big machine and there's some hardware glitch, then you can restart from that point. You know, so once the system kind of knows about the data and how it's being worked with, you can do automated checkpointing in a very efficient way. Um, you can also do lazy execution with, with tiling. I'll, I'll explain more about tiling later. But again, this is something that we added in 
later on, and, and, and it really did work because of having this knowledge about the data, what was being worked on when. Um, so originally, you know, I did this by hand on a simple 2D problem. Um, the plan originally was to work with Paul and David and that they were going to do a compiler-based code generator using something called rows. Um, but at, at that early stage, I was trying to simplify the, the design of the API, uh, simplify what had to be done. And actually I managed to simplify it down to the, just having those API calls, stuff that the only thing that had to be parsed was the, was the API calls, not the rest of the code. And therefore, in fact, it was possible to do that in MATLAB, which seems like a ridiculous language to use for code parsing. Um, we, we, we subsequently switched to Python, which makes you know, slightly more sense. Um, in fact, um, you know, Paul and David did experiment with, with Rose, and Rose simply couldn't cope with the size of you know, the complexity of the Hydra code. And so that, that didn't work. And, and so you know, we went with the MATLAB and then with the Python code generation. Um, and that, that did what was necessary. Um, but I have to say that in, in the end, only two codes really used OP2. There was Hydra, which was a dating application. Um, and then there was a 2, 2D tsunami code from UCL, um, which uh, also used it. And the, the, the tsunami code, because it was 2D, it had relatively small data requirements. The performance for that was really great. With Hydra, the performance was not so good on, on the GPU hardware of that time, because Hydra had a lot more data at the grid point, and it just needed a lot of registers. Uh, later GPU hardware had a lot more registers, and so the performance now, I think, on GPUs is, is good. But, but we also had an OpenMP backend, which was good for the distributed memory CPU version, and that, that did well. Um, Yes, and so Paul, Paul and David also did um, LP2, uh, so Python version, which fed into Phoenix, and then some of the ideas from that then fed into Firedrake, which which David's talked about previously. Okay. Oh, I see Jeremy's apologizing for sound problems. Yeah, I'm 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 sorry as well. This has been more problematic. So tell me if, if I'm coming through either two loud or too soft and I can see if I can adjust things here. I think the problem is actually uh, your Wi-Fi connection, Mike. It seems it's... Um, oh, okay. Uh, which is a different yeah. a different issue. Yeah. Okay. But, but you're still comprehensible. Um, okay, good. So th there was another project went on with, with a PhD student, Guido Klingbeil. This was in the area of stochastic biochemical reaction simulations, a completely different uh, application. But again, we wanted both GPU performance, but a nice, you know, simple interface for users. Um, and so he constructed this MATLAB-based um, function, which took the specification of the problem from the user and then did code generation customized to the particular user application rather than the whole generic class of stochastic biochemical reactions. Um, and that, that was really straightforward to, to accomplish. I should say that at, at the time, and we, we, we were approaching this as sort of mathematicians, engineers with really limited to know computer science background. And it was interesting to us to find out what was possible in terms of code generation. Um, yeah, so that, that worked well um, and had significant benefits over a more general sort of library approach where you could handle 
an arbitrary number of reactions and reactants and, and things, but that would have a lot of conditional code to, to cope with that generality. Whereas doing code generation for the specific needs of one particular reaction system, you can get much higher performance. Um, there was another project going on in the computer science uh, department at, at that time. So I was aware, aware of this project, um, but not, not really involved in it. Um, so that was Luke, Luke Carty's PhD. Um, so I really don't remember much more beyond what's written on this slide at this point. Um, so uh, I guess I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that. But the key thing was he managed to achieve good performance for a range of applications comparable to hand coded for individual applications. So again, it's demonstrating, you know, the power of code generation and the ability to get good performance. We then OPS, which was a follow on project to OP2, um, working with block structure grids. Um, in a way, it seems like that's actually the, the complexity is, is having lots of those grids connected in an arbitrary way. Um, and so, again, there's a lot of data exchange going on. This was partly motivated by a collaboration with a AWE, which is the, the Atomic Weapons Establishment, um, in the sense, you know, the UK equivalent of DOE. And, um, you know, again, achieved good good performance on, on some of their test codes. Um, what was the best way to achieve future proof performance for their simulation codes? Um, but it was always clear that if, if they liked the approach, that they would then go off and re-implement it from scratch. So they totally sort of owned and controlled their, their code. Um, and then again, it mentions doing tiling for lazy execution, but that did get done later. Yeah, so let, let, let me explain that tiling point. So this is a sort of trivial little explicit time marching thing where the superscript is, is the time step and the subscript is the spatial position. And so here we are creating a new value at the new time step n plus one based on the value at the previous time step at the grid point and at its two neighbors, okay? Now, normally, so mathematically, we would think of, okay, we, we start with our initial data at time zero, then we move everything forward to time one, and then we move everything forward to time two, and, and so on. Um, but what that does, if you're working on a large 3D application, is by the time you've worked your way across the entire grid, moving to the first time step, the data at the beginning has got pushed out of cache. And so when you come to the second time step, everything has to be loaded back in again from the main memory. So instead, what we can do is to tile it. So here, tile A, you, know, you, you do a small piece of, of the original grid and you work forward in time based on you know, the, the data dependency. So you can complete the A tile with that resident within the cache. You know, so we're cutting down this data movement. And then once you finish tile A, you can then move on and you can do tile B. And again, that's, that stays resident in cache during multiple time steps. And so the effect of this is to greatly reduce the amount of, of data traffic required between the main memory and, and the processor. 
this is an example of something where to hand code this as part of a scientific application would be a complete pain. So you really want to have a high level specification of what your algorithm is that kind of ignores all of this and then separate out into a backend implementation you know, that then thinks through this and does does the, the dependency analysis to work out what can be done, you know, and and so you know that 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 I think is another strong argument for this separation, this this abstraction, and that and, and that really did did work well in practice. Um, there was also another little computational finance project I did with a summer student. Um, you know, looking at so stochastic differential equations and PDEs, um, where this was again using code generation, writing a code generator in Python, which you know really really would probably be my my choice of language for this stuff, where it brings in a user specification either as an XML file that has nice Python processing for that, or through a GUI, you know. You know, different users may, may want to interact with things in different ways, um, but then generates backend code appropriate to the platform of interest. You know, and that, that, that was a nice sort of proof of concept demonstration. Okay, so final slide. Um, what, what did I learn from all of this? Certainly, one thing I learned is that code generation is not difficult, you know, certainly not as difficult as I originally thought, that really somebody with a computational science training can do code generation. The sort of thing that I would not be capable of doing is the code parsing and analysis. That's really the hard thing. And, you know, I guess to, to, to most of you, that's a, an obvious statement, but that wasn't something that I knew when I started this process. Um, you know, the code, code generation can do things that let regular libraries can't do. And I think particularly for new architectures, it is necessary you know, in order to do things like CUDA. You, know, you, you, you have to generate CUDA code in order to execute onto the GPU. Although maybe with some of the new OpenMP features, maybe you can avoid getting into CUDA. Um, if you're doing a general package, you can also justify putting a whole lot of extra effort into optimizations and extensive error checking, you know, if, if that package is going to be used for multiple different applications. That's kind of the challenge. You know, it's difficult coming up with software which is useful for a wide range of different applications. That, that was also a conclusion of all this work. So OP2 in the end only got used for those two applications. Um, I would be interested to hear from people whether they think just-in-time compilation is, is a good thing to do and how, you know, how much that contributes to achieving a high, high performance. We, we, we never quite got to the point of, of, of doing that. And I don't think Gihan or Ishvan have subsequently investigated that. Um, yeah, the last bullet's the interesting one. Who, who will fund this sort of thing? This is, this is a difficulty in terms of developing software tools to be used by other people. I, I, I remember I had an email from a professor at RPI in the States who was interested in perhaps using OP2 for a couple of his, his PhD students on a, on a project, but he wanted to be sure that OP2 would have at least a four-year life, lifespan you know, to take it through to the end of his student's PhD. And I simply couldn't guarantee that. You know, there wasn't any funding for ongoing support. In, in practice, Rolls-Royce has continued to, to support it because it is critical to, to the Hydra code. Um, but 
you know that 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 is a problem with with, with work in this area. It, it's one thing to get the research funding to write the research papers and and you know get 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 some PhD theses out, but to then support tools longer term, um, I think in, in in the UK we struggle with 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 that. In, in in the US, if it's good enough, then maybe the DOE will 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 come up with with financial support for that sort of thing. Okay, so that that, that brings me to to the end.